Let's go to the Lord in prayer once more. Father, we need you now to reveal your truth to us in this word, to help us to see the gospel clearly. So Lord, use your spirit in our hearts. Use your spirit through me so that I can proclaim boldly and clearly the truth of the gospel. In your name I pray, amen. If Christ appeared to you this afternoon, what would you say to him? I wager that many of you have thought about what you will say on the day that you get to meet your Savior face to face. But what about the other way around? What would the resurrected Jesus say to you? Of course, we can't really know what Jesus would say today, but for a group of people 2,000 years ago, we know exactly what the resurrected Jesus said to them. Repeatedly, his message was the gospel. He pointed to the scriptures and explained how they pointed to this gospel. He pointed to the purpose of the gospel. And so what does that tell us? If Jesus' message as he appeared was the gospel, then the gospel message for us today is the most important thing that we could hear from God. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning This morning, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15, and we are going to see this message of the gospel. So please turn there if you haven't already. The gospel delineates between between people, and the facts of the gospel matter. It defines who is a Christian and who is not. If you're a Christian, understanding and responding to this gospel is the most significant thing that has ever happened in your life. And if you're not a Christian, your eternal future depends upon how you respond to this gospel. Our main point this morning is this. You must understand the gospel, and that understanding must drive your response to the gospel. And to see this clearly, we're going to see eight crucial truths These eight truths found in verses 1 through 11 show us the gospel and help us understand it and respond to it. And to show this most clearly, I've bunched them into three different groups. And the first, what we'll see in these preliminary truths is this. The gospel is preached. The gospel is preached. We see this at the beginning of verse 1. Paul starts by reminding the Corinthians, of the gospel. He wants to make known to them the gospel. And by stating it this way, he makes clear that he has already preached this to them. And so in a way, this sort of functions as a rebuke to this church, a church that prided itself in its spiritual knowledge. And here, Paul is taking them back to the basics. But it's a good point, and it's something that we need to also see. We need to come back to these basics Because this message is not from men, it's from God. So what is this gospel? It's the message that is good news. It alters eternity. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead, securing eternal life for all who repent of their sin and put their faith in him alone for salvation. That's the gospel, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. We see here in verse 1 that the gospel is preached, it's proclaimed, it's heralded. Not all gospel sharing is preaching, but all preaching must have gospel sharing. A sermon without the gospel is just a lecture or something worse. And the main point may not always be the gospel, but the gospel must always be included. And so if the gospel is going to be heard anywhere, it must be when the man of God opens up the word of God and points people to the work of God. Now certainly Paul has a primary focus. 
actual faithful sermon preaching that proclaims the gospel. And we see this modeled throughout the New Testament. But this idea certainly extends further. The gospel must be proclaimed. And there's two other ways that this happens. The gospel is proclaimed when it's shared with others. When it's shared with others. Wherever God has placed you in your life, he has done this with intention and purpose. You are a witness to the greatest truth in all the world. And so whether you're a mom of a three-year-old, you're a student with classmates, you work a trade job, you have a desk job, God has placed you there to be a proclaimer of this message, of this good news. The other way to preach this gospel is to preach it to yourself. You need this daily. The example of the Corinthians is helpful for us. There were things that were happening in this church that were very displeasing to God. They were consumed with minor things, and they were forgetting the things that were most important. We can do that too. We can move right past the majors and focus on the minors. Yes, theology is interesting. Certainly, right doctrine is important. And absolutely, great teachers are blessings. But if the focus turns to those things at the expense of the gospel, there are problems. And so Paul here is telling us that we need to major on the majors and minor on the minors. The gospel is most foundational. It's how we relate to God. It's how we relate to others. So don't move past that. We all need this reminder. The first preliminary truth is that the gospel must be preached. Our second one is this. The gospel is received. We see this at the end of verse 1 and verse 2. The gospel must be received. Paul writes, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. And there's really three parts to this. They had received it, and so Paul is recognizing their past belief. And he states that, and he acknowledges that they're presently standing in it. So they currently believe this. And now he expresses a surety that they are being saved. That their future is certain because of their faith. And so Paul shows the, the breadth of salvation, the breadth of gospel belief. It's past, present, and future. And all of this is because they've received the gospel. The gospel demands a response. Just like proclaiming the gospel must mean that you personally are involved in that process, so too, receiving the gospel is personal. You must be involved a response is demanded. Holding fast is an active engagement with your faith. Faith. It's not a passive thing that you check on once a week on Sunday morning. Passively partaking in the life of a church without truly responding to the good news does you no good. Growing up in a Christian family does not save you. Taking your kids to church does not save you. Being here does not save you. You must receive the implanted word which is able to save your soul. You must believe in the gospel. So how is your faith doing? Has it been a while since you've thought about the most important relationship that you have? The relationship with your God, your maker? This is one of the reasons that Paul has taken this turn here in 1 Corinthians. He wants to remind us of the gospel. Holding fast is essential. It's not optional. And turning away from this gospel is spiritual death. And so Paul, he's exhorting this church, he's exhorting you to hold fast, to not look away, to not forget. Why, why is he doing this? Why is he 
asking us and, and begging us and, and exhorting us to hold fast. Well, look at the end of verse 2. We see there that it's possible to believe in vain. This means to believe without being careful, without having thought through all of the details, believing haphazardly. Hasty, careless belief is just as dangerous as unbelief. Why? Because it fools you into thinking that you are safe. It's like blindly jumping off a high dive without checking if there's water in the pool first. And so Paul warns about vain faith for a very specific reason. If you claim to be a Christian and you deny a core part of the gospel, you undercut the foundation of your faith and your belief is going to come crashing down. It's not that you might lose your faith. It's that you have a void faith. Your faith is pointless. And so Paul wants to remind us of the truths of the gospel so that you would have a true saving faith, not a vain, empty one. So let's look at these truths which lie at the the core of our faith, the truths that, that form the gospel that we preach, the gospel that we receive, And these are the truths that make us Christians. And so we see this here. We have four core truths. There's four core truths of the gospel. The good news in its most basic form consists of these things. Core truth number one, Christ died for our sins. Look now at verse three where we see this. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. A creed is a summary affirmation of core Christian beliefs. And that's what we find here. Paul is likely phrasing this in a way that reflected an early Christian understanding of the gospel, an early creed. And he's communicating this way to show us that this is what Christians believe. This is what makes them Christians. And he's communicating it this way to show that it's not his gospel alone. It's one that's been delivered to him. He's received it. And even though he's likely talking about this revelation from Jesus personally, the bigger point is that he is passing along the same gospel message as every other person who proclaims the gospel. First importance. There are many famous messages in history. The first telephone call on March 10th, 1876. The announcement of victory in Europe after World War II. The words of Neil Armstrong as he stepped on the moon on July 20th, 1969. Yet no message is more important, more transformational more eternally impactful for your soul than the message that Paul shares here. This gospel message is the most significant message ever shared in human history. And the first part of it is this, Christ died for our sins. It's helpful if we start with the end, our sins. Our sins create a barrier a barrier between us and God. Notice that that Paul uses our. He's lumping himself in here with all humanity. No one is free from this assessment. We all share in this sin problem. A common refrain is that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And that's true. We are all in need of help because we have this barrier that separates us from God. So what is this barrier? A pastor illustrated it like this. Say you have a friend, Fred, and you are friends for a long time, but your friendship starts to go south. He starts breaking promises that he's made to you. 
He starts saying awful things about you to others, and then he starts saying them to your face. He starts taking your things, taking your things. Sometimes it's, it's small things at first, but as it goes on, he's taking more stuff. He's taking your money. He's robbed from you. He's taking your credit cards and maxed them out. And after all of this comes out, Fred says to you, well, can't we still be friends? I'll do better. I'll try to be good. I'm very sorry. Well, Fred... I'm sorry, but there are big issues in our relationship. You've been personally harmful to me. You've said things that hurt. You've committed crimes against me. And it's not enough just to be sorry. You've robbed, you've you've committed a crime. There's injustice that's been done. And sorry is a start, but, but something has to be changed for us to be friends again. A technical way of describing this is that we have been personally and legally alienated. Our sin is a big deal. It alienates you from God on two levels. Your sin allows for no personal relationship with God. And your sin also breaks God's holy standard. And God's just. He punishes lawbreakers. And so you, as a lawbreaker, you deserve a punishment. And this is the barrier between you and God. It's personal and it's legal. And only God can remove this barrier. We see that here. Christ died. His death has brought salvation and removed the barrier so that all who would believe might draw near to God. And they can draw near, not in fear, but with joy as a child of the king. But for this to happen, the Messiah had to die. And throughout scripture, there are different word pictures that reveal different angles of this death and what it accomplished. One is this idea that God has redeemed us from slavery. On the cross, he paid the price so he could redeem us as one of his own kinsmen. Another angle is that Christ died to defeat the power of sin. He conquered it. The power that's in our hearts, the the power that's consuming our world, Christ died to defeat that power, to win a victory. And so we are free. One last angle to consider, Jesus has paid the legal penalty of our sin. God administered justice. He punished our sin, but he punished Christ because Christ stepped in and took that punishment. I've avoided one word in the middle of that sentence, but I want to zoom in on it now. For Christ died for our sins. For doesn't really do it justice. The idea behind this preposition in Greek is on behalf of. Christ died on behalf of our sins. He died for us. A key concept undergirds this for. It's the concept of substitution. The British theologian John Stott rightly said that if one is going to understand salvation... They need to understand two words, sin and substitution. Sin is declaring to your maker that you are the Lord of your life. Sin is substituting yourself for God. Salvation is God substituting himself for you. Jesus stands in your place to take your punishment. And then he gives you his righteousness, substituted to you, so that you would stand justified. You stand just as if you had never sinned and just as if you had always obeyed. This is what removes the barrier of our sin. Paul says that this took place in accordance with the scriptures. And likely he has in mind here Isaiah 53. 
there, it was God's intended will to send a servant, the son, to be sacrificed. There also is the idea of substitutionary atonement. Our sin is laid on him. He bears the sins of the many as our substitute. And most clearly in Isaiah 53, we see that he is a man. All throughout the Bible, there are animals that are sacrificed. But the only true sacrifice that truly can substitute and step in the place and appease God's wrath and give righteousness to people is this man, this holy, perfect man, the Son of God, stepping in as a substitute. And so Paul sees all of this and knows that the crucifixion of Christ happened according to God's revealed plan in Scripture. The Son of God had to die. The next core truth is that Christ was buried. This is a shorter one, but why does Paul include this? How do you prove death? Well, if there's a body to bury. Christ's burial was the undeniable reality that Christ had died. Early heresies about Jesus denied that he had a true body of flesh and blood, that it was just this spiritual illusion. Well, there's a bunch of problems with that. Because if that was true, the gospel would be hollowed of all of its saving power. And Paul makes certain to refute this error by highlighting the burial of Jesus. Jesus truly died upon the cross. His death proves his humanity. It proves that he really suffered and died as a human man. Christ's death was necessary. He had to pay the full price of sin. Blood had to be shed and death was required so that life might be given. So another aspect of this death is that Christ has redeemed the human experience. He had to be our representative in life and in death so that he could redeem those who live and those who die. And so Christ's burial is the proof of this, that he represented humanity in every way, even unto death. The next core truth is this. Christ was raised. Christ was raised on the third day. And the implications are enormous. Christ was raised. Notice that the passive there, the tense is important. It reveals that someone else raised Christ from the dead. And even though this was a past action, the way this this verb works, it, it continues to be true in the present. God raised Christ from the dead, and he lives even now. And so this reveals a truth, that God alone has resurrection power. And for the Corinthians, this is especially important. One of the reasons that Paul has gone this direction, talking about the gospel, is because of this resurrection idea. Verse 12 reveals that there were members of this church who were denying resurrection in general. That there was no restoration after death. It was done. It was permanent. That's a huge issue because the resurrection is foundational to the gospel. And to deny the resurrection in general is to deny the specific resurrection of Jesus. And so this is why the implications of this simple statement, Jesus rose, Christ rose from the dead, are enormous. Because Paul is going to spend the rest of this chapter talking about the resurrection and the implications for the Christian. But for this morning, I want to focus on two key points. The implication of Jesus' resurrection in general, and the implication for your own spiritual walk. A faithful pastor has these striking words for us. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? 
Our faith hinges upon this resurrection. If the resurrection happened, then it proves that Jesus is God. It proves that that God has the power over death. And if the resurrection did not happen, there's no hope. A man died just like all men died. And there's no reason to listen to this God because it would seem that he can do nothing. But because the resurrection did happen, we know that we do not believe in vain. We have real hope because we have a real God who gives real life to his people. And we should really care about then what God would have to say to us as Christians. We see that this resurrection was in accordance with the scriptures. Paul is is referencing this generally. He surely has in mind Psalm 16, where David speaks of the Holy One at the end there, about the Holy One not facing the permanent corruption of death. And what's clear by this idea is that the resurrection is God's work alone. It comes from his promises, his power, his grace. So turning now to the implication for your own life. If you have been a Christian for any amount of time, you know that you still sin. You feel the hypocrisy of it. You do the very thing that you hate. And that sin is accompanied with this this rending feeling of guilt and shame. There's frustration because you've done it again. This is the struggle with sin. Redeemed souls living in sinful flesh. And it can be agonizing. Paul Paul drives this out and and shows us what this looks like in Romans 7 when he cries out, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That is often the cry of our hearts. That we just see our sin We see our death. And this battle is exhausting. And far too often, we see the tsunami wave of guilt, of shame, of condemnation, and we just let it crash over us. We drown ourselves. Well, here is where the truth of the resurrection needs to come into your heart. It needs to shine light into the darkness. Here's an illustration. If you are in prison for a crime and the penalty is met, the fine is paid, the time is served, how do you know that you are free? Well, it's when the door swings open and you are released. The implication is that the cost is paid, the penalty is met. Well, this is exactly what happens with the resurrection. The the door is open. Jesus is released from death. And what's the implication? That he's paid the price. That is paid in full. It's done. Your sin, your, your crimes against God have been fully and utterly paid for on the cross. And his death displays that the penalty is paid. It's done. This is why Paul can say, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what is the implication for us then if we are struggling and consumed with guilt and shame? When the devil lies to your heart and says, you're no Christian, you're condemned. Well, in that moment, this is what you must do. Christian, you need to go to the gospel and you need to point to the resurrection and say, fair, there's the proof that I'm free. There's the proof that I no longer stand condemned because the penalty was paid and my Savior lives. The resurrection shouts your freedom. And it proclaims that we are not guilty because we stand righteous in Christ before God. We've seen the three core truths of the gospel so far. Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried. Christ rose on the third day. And now the last core truth of the gospel. Christ appeared. We see this in verses five through seven. John MacArthur has the best explanation of this truth. 
What's the best evidence to show that you've risen from the dead? Show up. Just like Christ's burial proves his death, Christ's appearance proves his resurrection. And Paul is taking care to really show the reality of this gospel and how important it was for Christ to die and to come back from the dead. Do you know what footnotes are? In academic papers and books, we use footnotes to provide the proof for what we're saying, for our claims. So, for example, the greater Richmond area in 2020 had a population of 1,314,000. Footnote, U.S. Census Bureau. They have the data. They have the sources. They can prove what I'm saying. And some basement in Washington, D.C. has those records. I'm citing my sources. Well, in the time of Jesus and Paul, there weren't footnotes. But there were ways to write that functioned in the exact same way. And that's what Paul is doing here. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. Jesus has appeared in the flesh. Footnote one, Peter. Footnote two, the 12 disciples. Footnote three, 500 Christian brothers. Footnote four, James and all the apostles. You want proof of this resurrection? Go talk to the witnesses. Go ask them who they saw. Go ask Thomas whose hands he touched. Go ask these 500 brothers. This is only 20 years likely removed from the cross. Most of them are still living, Paul says. You can go talk to them and they will tell you exactly who who they saw. These witnesses all bear a testimony of the risen Jesus. Their testimony was backed up by miracles. Their testimony was confirmed by their changed lives. Their testimony was proven by the fact that basically every apostle would die for their words bearing witness to the risen Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, the resurrection is not just a a spiritual or theological event. It's a historical reality. And we have the historical eyewitness accounts here in Scripture. Yet apart from the work of God... In one's heart, no one will believe this. The world looks upon the idea of a crucified and risen Savior and scoffs. And so Paul says earlier in 1 Corinthians, Jews demand a signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. This is how the world sees our gospel message, as foolishness. But Paul continues, But for those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. It's only by God's grace that anyone can receive these gospel truths, can hear this historical reality and believe. It's only by God's grace because he transforms us with this gospel. And so, Paul now turns from these core truths to discuss the transformation that this gospel brings. And we'll see it in these last two truths. The first of these is this. The gospel transforms, verses 8 through 10. Paul has been talking about the appearance and the resurrection of Jesus, and now he's taking a very personal turn, a turn that reveals how this gospel works in the life of a person. Look at verse 8. Last of all, As to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. 
though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Untimely born. Paul here is describing his conversion experience in a most dramatic way. It was an an abnormal birth, unexpected. And we know this if if we look at Acts. We see that Paul was a hater of Christians. He was complicit in the murderous persecution of the church. Paul was the very Jew of all Jews, and he hated Gentiles. Everything that Paul had stood for opposed the gospel. Paul was dead in his sins, hardened against God. And yet what happened? God, by his grace, chose to take the worst of the worst and make him the foremost example of a transformed life. Paul, once a hater of the gospel, would spend every ounce of his life preaching it. Paul, once a persecutor of the church, would pour out himself to build it up. Paul, once a reviler of the Gentiles, would love them so much that he would spend his life bringing the gospel to them. This is a transformed life. Paul has been born again. This is what gospel transformation does. It radically changes hearts. Values are changed. Priorities are are realigned. And Paul recognizes this in himself personally. Notice all of the, the personal words there. He appeared to me. I am the least. I persecuted. I am what I am. His grace toward me. I worked harder. Not I, but the grace that is with me. Gospel transformation is personal. Notice the recurring words through these three verses. Grace. God's grace is sufficient to bring about this transformation. God's grace takes the worst and transforms them for his purposes. God's grace fuels this transformation. It fuels the work so that Paul can truly say, I worked harder than any of the other apostles, but also recognize that it was the grace of God that was working in him. Can you identify with Paul in this gospel transformation? Do you struggle with feeling unworthy? If you are a believer, God's grace is working in you right now. His grace towards you is not in vain. As a Christian, God's grace has been working since the foundations of the earth to draw you to himself to give you faith, to grow your faith, and to hold you fast until you're all the way home. So this is the power of a personal testimony. It communicates this gospel transformation. It shows how God's grace has worked in your life. God has worked his grace into your life in unique and specific ways that are exactly what you need And so sharing your testimony, it shouldn't proclaim how cool you are. It should proclaim how awesome your God is. So this is a very practical way to reflect on God's grace in your life. Share your testimony. Share your testimony with your kids. Use your testimony when you share the gospel. Encourage your fellowship group with your testimony Be reminded of your own testimony so that you can remember afresh God's grace in your life. How he continues to provide through this whole journey that we're on until we're at our eternal home. You have to look at God's grace. Lastly, we see this in verse 11. The gospel is foundational. Paul concludes this opening section of the chapter by going back to an idea found in verse 1. In verse 1, he says, I want to make known to you the gospel I preach to you. Well, here he repeats the same idea, but with a, a subtle tweak. So verse 11, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. He's shifted from the singular to the plural. There's only one gospel. There's only one truth. 
It doesn't matter who preaches it. It could be Paul or any other apostle, whoever. But it's not about the messenger. It's about the message. Our message of the gospel has to be about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's it. That's the good news. And there's only two responses to this. And both have eternal consequences. You can reject it and face eternal condemnation. Or you can respond in repentance and faith and find eternal life. The true gospel is foundational. It's what the church has preached. It's what the true church has believed. So brother or sister, if you're here today and Grace Bible Church isn't the church for you, that's fine. But be in a church that preaches the gospel in all of its glory. Wherever that might be. This is really what church membership is about. Membership isn't anything more than binding ourselves to the true gospel and promising to help one another never forget it. So, member, are you committed to this? Are you committed to this gospel? Are you asking for others to help you stay committed to this gospel, to help you hold fast and persevere to the end? Or maybe you're a lone ranger Christian here this morning. You're content to be independent and justifying it because you are in a certain age group, you're in a certain place in life. Well, here's the newsflash. There aren't independent Christians in the Bible. No, the gospel takes a people who are not a people and makes them a people. The gospel creates a family. And this people, this family, the church, becomes visible in the gathering of a local church like we're doing this morning. The gospel is the foundation of every true local church. And so, are you a part of a local church? Or are you merely taking part of the benefits without the commitment? Certainly, the gospel is the foundation of our relationships in the local church. But even more fundamental than that, the gospel is the foundation with how we relate to one another as true Christians. The gospel is how we can love someone who is different than us. Someone who worships differently. Someone who schools differently. Someone who has a different background, different expectations, different concerns. Whatever those differences are, If we're both Christians, we both share in the most important foundational thing, the gospel. We both are sinners. Our Savior died for both of us. His resurrection proclaims that we are both freed from our sins. We've both repented of our sin. We've both placed our faith alone in our Savior. We've both been forgiven of this incalculable debt. We've both freely tasted God's grace and seen how it works in our life. So how should we view one another? By our differences? No, we need to view each other through our shared gospel that brings us salvation. So the next time you're frustrated with a a brother or sister, a a quirk annoys you, a, a difference seems to create a gulf, a barrier arises in your relationship, what must you do? You must go back to this gospel. This is the shared foundation. You must go back to this gospel and be reminded that you both hold this gospel in common. You share something so foundational that any difference can be overcome. This is the unity of our faith. This is the unity that we have in this gospel. In closing... I have two big questions that I'd like you to consider. First, I'd like to talk to the person who is on the fence. Maybe this is your first Sunday ever hearing this gospel message. Maybe you've grown up your whole life hearing this gospel message. Maybe your parents make you come, or you're here because you want to make your wife happy. Whatever your situation is, You're not sure. You're skeptical. 
you're unsure about Christianity. Well, here's my question for you. Do you really understand this Christianity that you're rejecting? Friend, have you really looked at this gospel message? Christ is here, and he's calling for you to believe. And all who seek him, he will not turn away. So come, find salvation for your soul. Repent of your sin. Trust in Jesus as your Savior. Talk to me after the service. Talk to anyone in this room. It very well might be the most important conversation you ever have in your life. Now, believer, here's my question for you. Do you really understand the Christianity you claim? We were discussing this passage this week, and one of our elders had a comment. If the Corinthians needed to be reminded of the gospel so close to the cross 20 years later, what does that tell us about our need? We need to understand what we believe. We need to be reminded of this weekly, daily. We need to know that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the grave for us. And so this gospel should affect every aspect of your life. So do you understand the heart of Christianity? Do you understand that this gospel is central? Do you marvel at these simple words, Jesus died for our sins? Do you care that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day? This is the gospel. We must not turn from it. So let's pray now for God's grace to hold us fast. God, we thank you for this message from Paul. We thank you that the gospel is clear that it's simple, that it's proclaimed here in this church, that we have access to it in your word. Lord, I pray that we would preach this gospel, that we'd receive it, that we'd believe it with our hearts, that we would marvel at the truths that Jesus died from our sins, for our sins, that he rose from the dead to give us life. Lord, have the gospel impact our hearts today, this week. Cause us to think on these things. Hold us fast in your grace, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen.